You're listening to The World at Eat with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 26th of April. Free speech, only if you're Muslim. UKIP knee-jerk over embarrassing candidates. She costs very little for your pleasure. The secret of German success, low unemployment and poor pay. Nick Griffin, MEP, on UKIP, a Tory by another name, the full text of which can be found at www.radiobritainonline.info. She's the one US sailor thwarts Dubai rape attempt. US Defence Department blocks Baptist website, calls contents hostile. School forces girls to ask for lesbian kiss. Twitter hackers send Dow Jones plunging 100 points. Thought for the day, can we live with what we have created or have we? And finally, a dog in sheep's clothing. QK News. Free speech only if you're a Muslim. This week, Leyland Central Labour councillors Derek Forrest and Caleb Tomlinson spoke out against BMP candidate Tony Bamber's leaflets as being racist trash and full of loathing and hatred towards a religious group. And Ali Amla of Preston Faith Forum reported the matter to the police. Lancashire police said they were unable to take any action. A police spokesman said, We understand that some people may find the content of the leaflet disturbing or offensive. The Lancashire police takes the distribution of these leaflets very seriously and have previously investigated their content. An individual was charged and sent to Crown Court. However, after consideration, the court found that the content of the leaflet did not constitute an offence. As no such crime is being committed in the distribution of these leaflets. The same week down the road in Birmingham, up to 35,000 British, Pakistani men, women and children from across the UK gathered in Aston Park here to express their love for Hazrat Muhammad, peace be upon him, this presenter says bloody hell, and to call on the British government to introduce legislation that bars Islamophobes from insulting Islam under the garb of freedom of speech. They were joined by supporters from several European cities and the participants, who also travelled from several parts of European cities, were led in a peaceful and colourful mile-long march by Hazrat Pir Aluddin Siddiqui. This the fourth consecutive gathering for the biggest Malad al-Nubi. Peace be upon him. Who the hell is this guy? Speakers included interfaith leaders from Christian, Hindu, Sikh and Jewish religions and parliamentarians from Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrats. Notable speakers included the disgraceful Labour peer Lord Ahmed, UKIP MEP Nikki Sinclair and Sada Atik Khan, formerly as Zad Kashmir Prime Minister, who was the chief guest of the rally. Speakers said that freedom of speech was a cherished value, but abusing Islam is not a freedom of speech. They said Muslims were making a great contribution towards everyday life in Western countries and it's important that their contribution is recognised. World Today says, This is rich coming from Lord Ahmed who has twice been suspended from the Labour Party for his anti-Semitic remarks and bounty offer on Presidents Obama and Bush. As usual, he can think and do as he pleases, and the rest of us are supposed to be legislated into accepting his two-faced concept of freedom of speech. This is Islam at its contemptible worst. UKIP knee-jerk over embarrassing candidates. A UKIP Independence Party candidate in East Sussex has been suspended by the party over reports she posted anti-Semitic comments online and in Cornwall, UKIP withdraws support and membership of former British National Party member. Anna Maria Crampton was due to stand for election in Crowborough in next Thursday's county council elections. Comments made in her name on a website in February claim the Jews deliberately caused World War II and sacrificed their own people in the gas chambers. She's denied writing the remarks and said her account had been hacked. UKIP leader Nigel Farage said, I've learnt about this, I've looked at it, and from this moment she does not have the endorsement of our party. 
In another development this week, UKIP withdrew its support for North Cornwall local election candidate Sue Bowen after it emerges she was once an activist for a far-right party. UKIP said that the party's rules do not permit former members of the BNP to join the party or stand as candidates. Well, this World Date writer says, Whilst the British National Party accepts all ethnicities and will accept almost anyone, no matter what their previous political leanings, I wonder how long it would be before the government and the EHRC had us back in court if we expelled any member advocating a vote for another political party, especially UKIP. The core of the EHRC case against the British National Party was that its membership rules excluded certain individuals and was therefore not representative of all peoples. It seems the same is true of UKIP's membership rules, except this time it's being ignored by the EHRC because it works against people who may have nationalist leanings. In the case of Anne-Marie Crampton, it was less than a knee-jerk reaction as her alleged comments were posted in February and is more of a long stretch and a yawn. In Sue Bowen's case, it was dealt with almost overnight, so we can see that anti-Semitism raises less of an eyebrow than having been a member of the British National Party. European News. She costs very little for your pleasure. What follows is an email and blog excerpt that came our way. The tragedy engulfing Greece is something we all need to be aware of. Why is it that our own mainstream media and politicians are all looking the other way? Today, in April 2013, everything in Greece is for sale. Two days ago, a small girl, aged no more than 10, I'd estimate, came up to me playing her violin in a main market thoroughfare close to the Acropolis. She wasn't much of a violinist, but after finishing the piece, she said something to me, and I, of course, didn't understand. A man watching nearby, resigned of expression, said, She is saying she costs very little for your pleasure. I gave the kid a small coin and asked the bloke if this was commonplace. Not common, he replied, but not rare either. These bastards will reduce us to an animal state. I wanted to ask him more, but he waved me away. I don't blame him. Imagine how I'd feel in my own country being asked by a passing Swede if all English prepubescent kids now hoard on those streets. The secret to German success, low unemployment and poor pay. Berlin, with its record low unemployment, 5.4%, Germany stands out amongst fellow Eurozone countries such as France or Spain, suffering from sky-high jobless rates. Part of Germany's success is due to a series of reforms pushed through by the Social Green government of former Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder ten years ago, overhauling the labour market and welfare system. He made it easier for companies to hire and fire, lower taxes and limited social benefits. The Schroeder model is now viewed as a must-do for crisis-plagued EU countries in the South. But the flip side of Germany's high employment rate is low-paid and unstable jobs. A debate in the German Bundestag on Thursday, 25th of April, focused on the widening income gap and social inequality as Social Democrats and Greens unsuccessfully tried to introduce a German minimum wage. I now hand you over to Nick Griffin, MEP, who talks today mainly about UKIP and the establishment. According to political commentators in the broadsheet newspapers, the strategists of the old political parties are shocked and even mesmerised by the rise of UKIP. It shouldn't be. There's nothing shocking or surprising in it, and it's not irresistible. I'm going to concentrate on this subject tonight, mainly because it's the most significant thing going on in British politics at present. And secondly, because I spent this week in Brussels in intensive planning discussions with other key nationalists on the programme of our foundation. We've come up with some very exciting proposals, but just for now, we have to keep them under wraps, so I can't tell you any more. To supporters and listening opponents alike, I'm sorry for being a political tease, but I have to say, wait and see. So let's get back to Maggie Farage and the others in the BBC licensed Rebellion Party. The surge of public support for UKIP is overwhelmingly the result of several years of increasingly blatant promotion by the BBC, but it is also based on very real public anger. Anger at seeing our country's past ridiculed, buried or dismantled. Our individual and collective present being turned into one long nightmare 
of tax demands, insecurity, frustration, foreign rule, and watching our masters rob us blind, and our future offering nothing but decline, material and spiritual poverty, and minority status in the ruins of our once great country. Of course there's a process building up. It's exactly the same protest that allowed the British National Party to come within just 50 votes of winning in 200 council seats in 2008. This was just one of the shocks to the system that led to a concerted, sustained attack on us by the combined forces of, well, I'll list what we faced in a moment, in order to highlight just what a remarkable thing the continued survival of the BNP really is. Before we look at how we're going to deal with UKIP, it's well worth taking a few moments to run through all the things that the establishment had to do to us to create the political space that Farage is now being helped to exploit. Remember what we've had to face. The Conservatives, Lib Dems and the Labour Party, the BBC, the entire corporate broadcast and print media with national newspapers running daily front page smears on us in the run up to important elections. The Equality Commission's 70 taxpayer funded lawyers doing their worst to close us down. Vexatious and time wasting legal attacks. A string of NGOs and big business funded think tanks ranging from the Joseph Roundtree Trust to Policy Exchange undertaking and funding detailed studies of our support and how to undermine it. The trade union movement. The Muslim Council of Britain and the Board of Deputies of British Jews. Local councils denying us public meeting halls. The police intimidating venue owners to deny us private meeting rooms. Arrests and prosecutions of leaders and activists for speaking the truth and campaigning to spread it. The gerrymandering of electoral boundaries. Changes to the electoral system deliberately intended to hit us, ranging from the customising of the postal vote system to the abolition of the post of elected mayor in the city of Stoke. Changes in the law to allow groups not standing in elections to put out vast amounts of material against us in order to interfere with those elections. Massive electoral fraud. Thousands of voters, including the entire British police service, being told that voting BNP would cost them their jobs. Threats of eviction for social housing tenants displaying our posters. The persecution of members, ranging from being sacked at work to forbidden to run a Sea Scout group. Violent attacks by gangs of state-sponsored far-left thugs immune to prosecution for their crimes. Bureaucratic harassment, including denial of bank accounts and other facilities freely available to every other political party in the country. Subversion and black propaganda by full-time members of state security forces and by full and part-time infiltrators from at least two well-funded anti-nationalist campaigning bodies and a state-funded program to de-radicalise promising new members. By the way, despite all this, a combined assault the likes of which has never been launched against any party in British political history before, in spite of all that, we still have such a huge base of public sympathy that in Rotherham, Nigel Farage has just this week pointedly refused to sack a candidate with extensive BNP links, despite his pledge to do so in every case. Why? Because he knows perfectly well the enormous sympathy there is out there for brand BNP, especially in working class areas in Northern England. So he's using the link with a candidate who's also on record as being outspoken against Islam as a dog whistle to round up working class votes by giving them the impression that UKIP are like the BNP really, but just being subtle about it. It's just like his idle Thatcher's We Are Being Swamped anti-immigration hoax in 1978. So why are UKIP at present better able to tap into the public's growing anger over immigration than we are? That too is very simple. With the exception of a put up bit of pre-election theatrical persecution by Rotherham's Labour Council of two UKIP members, Nigel Farage's party has not faced a single one of the attacks against the BNP we've just examined. In complete contrast, UKIP enjoys the unstinting support of the BBC, the Murdoch media empire, most of Fleet Street, and a succession of multimillionaires with open checkbooks, reflecting UKIP's status as a front for big business and at least one foreign government with a long record of interfering in Western politics. Under these circumstances, the surprise isn't really UKIP's rise, but the fact it took so long. And the extent of public hostility to the entire political elite means that it's got further to run yet. The Labour Party and its allies in the BBC still seem oblivious to the fact that the Farage fire they lit to burn the Tories is going to make things very, very hot for them too. 
although the indecent haste with which Labour called the South Shields by-election is perhaps an indication that some of their strategists may be starting to wake up to the danger. Writing in The Guardian the other day, Andrew Rawnsley explained why all three main parties are vulnerable to UKIP. He concluded that, quote, a UKIP vote is not mainly, if at all, about making a choice based on an assessment of policy. More than anything, it's about expressing an emotion, usually a feeling of intense rage about how Britain has changed and how they are served by the established political parties. It's a howl against the modern world, a scream against the establishment. There's no arguing with that. Or, if there is a way of dealing with it, none of the main parties has yet discovered what it is. Some nationalists are also afflicted by this cretinous, rabbits-in-the-headlights paralysis. Those who went off into the wilderness following the failure of their dirty leadership campaign a few years ago are particularly despondent, maintaining that nothing can be done except sit and watch and whine and be depressing. Well, at least that's one thing they're good at. The truth is that there is no need to be frightened of UKIP. The time has come to understand what UKIP is, to confront UKIP and to work patiently to turn the UKIP phenomenon to our advantage. All these things can be done, and I'm going to explain how. I'll start by pointing out that we've already started. While the old parties and the negative cranks are behaving like frightened chickens, the only people in the country developing and putting out an anti-UKIP message are the BNP and other genuine nationalists. The nationalist think tank Third Way has published several biting critiques including a study of UKIP's Zionist agenda that attracted useful press coverage, and their incisive Beware UKIP Thatcherites. The Nationalist Union Solidarity has, as already been noted, produced a very effective A5 leaflet outlining how UKIP's ultra-globalist policies would hit both the wage packets and the workplace rights of millions of ordinary British voters. For ourselves, our website has been for several months carrying similar messages, and Freedom has tackled the UKIP question including a full double page spread in the latest issue. We are right now experimenting with several other anti-UKIP measures in the forthcoming local elections. As a third way, we've issued a hard hitting leaflet exposing Farage's Thatcherite agenda and hypocrisy and deceit on immigration. In the South Shields election, the British National Party is putting out two different leaflets to every household, each with a section containing the toughest criticism that UKIP has ever had to face. As Third Way have pointed out, UKIP is riddled with startling contradictions and inconsistencies. These can be worked on and exploited, not sometime in the future, but starting right now. So let's get down to the details. Our response has come under two broad headings, negative and positive. The first being what we have to do to UKIP, while the second is more about what we have to do to ourselves. Let's start with the negative campaigning, with putting the boot into Nigel. First, we need leaflets, papers and posters that expose UKIP's hypocrisy and corruption, their ultra Thatcherite community wrecking globalism, their support for the privatisation looting of our national commonwealth, their commitment to allowing multinational companies to devastate our green and pleasant land with GM crops and fracking. Most of all, we have to work to get over the fact that their so-called anti-immigration policy is a hoax designed to con voters into accepting continued massive third world immigration. Fittingly, for a self-confessed Thatcherite, Farage's secret plan to, quote, replace Poles with Pakis, unquote, as one politically incorrect wag has described UKIP's balanced migration proposals, is as deceitful and empty as Maggie's we are being swamped speech. We need to develop this campaign so as to ensure that people who agree with us either vote for us or, if we're not there, abstain from voting. UKIP are not an alternative. They're as bad as all the rest because they're the same as all the rest. Second, we need to step up our use of Facebook and other social networks to encourage ordinary people to give other ordinary people the shocking facts about UKIP's real agenda. How many women, for example, would vote for them if they knew that UKIP believe in a return to the days when greedy bosses could pay them less for doing exactly the same work as men? Third, we must routinely oppose UKIP's outreach operations. Up until now, Farage has been able to speak unopposed at meetings all over the country. We need to start attending his public meetings and asking awkward questions, or at least handing out leaflets about UKIP's big business agenda to members of the public going in. Similarly, the circulation online of digitally doctored photos of UKIP's deceitful billboards should help to reduce their effectiveness or even turn them against them. 
the power of social networks to shape public opinion and promote ideas and images that then turn into real life is huge and still largely untapped. We must work to change that. Fourth, there's immense scope for letters to local papers. While the majority of these routinely refuse to print pro-BNP letters, they will all be happy to run debates for and against UKIP. We shouldn't even mention the BNP. The aim of this operation is simply to put in front of their readers the stark facts about UKIP's hugely unattractive policies and the shocking voting record of their MEPs. True, it will take time for this campaign to take effect, but the more we do and the quicker we do it, the sooner we will start to see the impact. It certainly beats sitting and whining and worrying about how the BBC is helping them to steal our votes. Of course, there's a reasonable possibility that the real killer blow to UKIP will be delivered by Nigel Farage himself within a couple of years. If the Tories can be panicked into ditching Cameron, then Farage is already promised to try to do a deal with his successor. That could easily lead to UKIP being sucked back into the Conservative Party from whence it came, which makes UKIP's present role as a breaker of middle class voting habits a massive future plus for us. But we can't afford to sit on our hands and hope for the happy day. We must get to work now to block their drive for our existing mainly ex-Labour vote. Indeed, we're already hard at work on this. We'll get an early indication as to how effective that work can be on May the 2nd, because, as already explained, we are experimenting with our anti-UKIP operations in several county council wards and in the South Shields parliamentary by-election on the same day. Once we get a better idea of what works best, we will make it available nationwide so that everyone can join in. With these elections out of the way, we'll also be able to get down in earnest to the other part of our long fight back campaign. This is not about negative attacks on other parties, but rather how to present the BNP and our nationalist ideals in very positive ways. This is particularly vital if we're to put down roots with and inspire the large and growing section of the population that has at present given up on the whole political process. Again, after the election, I will be able to give you the results of our first exciting experiment that's already proven we can indeed do this. I will also go on to explain what we're going to do to promote the winning practical idealism of our nationalism. Because whether or not we win isn't up to UKIP or the BBC or any of our other opponents. It's up to us. If we wanted enough to work for it in the right ways, we'll get it. Thank you, Nick, for your eye-opening take on UKIP and the goings-on around election times in the UK. World News. She's the one US sailor thwarts Dubai rape attempt. Dubai, a bus driver who tried to rape a passenger at knife point, chose the wrong victim, a court heard yesterday. The woman, an off-duty US Navy sailor, knocked the knife from his grasp, broke it in two, bit his hand, wrestled him to the ground and put him in a stranglehold between her thighs. <laughs> Having beaten him into submission, she left the bus and reported the incident to her commander. I like that woman. U.S. Defense Department blocks Baptist website, calls content hostile. Chaplains with the Southern Baptist Convention said the U.S. military has blocked access to its website on bases around the nation, calling the content hostile and inappropriate. The blocking comes just weeks after army personnel cited Roman Catholics and Evangelical Christians as possible examples of extremists. This was reported on World Date, Wednesday 9th of April 2013. The Southern Baptist Convention is the USA's largest Protestant group and stands steadfast in its opposition to abortion and same-sex marriage. Chaplains told Fox News that SBCNet had been censored and those trying to access the site at various military bases were greeted with a warning. The site you have requested has been blocked by Team Conus due to hostile content, Fox News reported. This is deeply disturbing, says Singh Oldham, SBC spokesman to Fox News. While the Deputy Chief of Operations of the US Army has assured us that this is a random event with no malicious intent, the Army must run this to the ground to assure that this is the case. If the government in fact did intentionally block access, he continued to Fox News, that would be an unconscionable breach of trust with the American public. School forces girls to ask for lesbian kiss and boys get lessons in how to spot sluts. 
Outraged parents say a New York middle school instructed young female students to ask one another for a lesbian kiss and boys learnt how to spot young sluts in an anti-bullying presentation on gender identity and sexual orientation, according to Fox News. Todd Starnes. According to Starnes' report, the children attended a special April 11th health class taught by students at Linden Avenue Middle School in Red Hook, New York. Parents say they were not notified of the presentation. The students were introduced to terms such as pansexual and genderqueer. Some of the young female students said they were told it was common for 14-year-old girls to have sex and their parents couldn't stop them. The Poughkeepsie Journal reported that Red Hook Central School District Superintendent Paul Finch said the class focused on improving culture, relationships, communications and self-perceptions. Twitter hackers send Dow Jones plunging 100 points. Found on page 21 of Thursday's Daily Mail. Both the Dow Jones Industrial Average and Standard & Poor's 500 Index plunged about 1% before regaining their losses. $136.5 billion of the S&P 500 Index's value was momentarily wiped clean. Tweet was sent to AP's near 2 million followers and retweeted 1,181 times before deleting. White House Press Secretary, the President is fine. Group called the Syrian Electronic Army has claimed responsibility for hacking. Some traders blamed automatic electronic trading for the sharp fall and recovery and not human reaction to the report. No human believed the story. Only the computers react to something that's seriously disseminated in such a way. I bought some stock well and did not sell into it. World Today says, and therein lies the rub, blame the Syrians and prepare to invade. But somewhere, someone made a very tidy profit out of the rebound. Follow the money and the true hackers will be uncovered. Well, if it is a sad supporters, although all is fair in love and war, this certainly isn't love. Thought for the day. Can we live with what we've created or have we? Now there's a thought for the weekend for us nationalists. A bit of a quandary, I feel, with many sides to this particular argument. Looking at the terrible pictures of those poor souls being hauled out of the eight-storey factory in Bangladesh, several things cross my mind. Pity for those who are having to work in those conditions, the West who make that work possible, and the large corporations who feed off their desperation. You see, there are mixed messages there. That of greedy clothing manufacturers, even greedier customers, a section of society who wouldn't eat at all if that work didn't exist. Although there are also 1.3 million children in Bangladesh who work full-time to support their families, many of the sweatshop workers are women who work off-site, and often garment production is one of the only options open to poor rural women in their own homes. These women have little education or training, and work can be done whilst a woman cares for her children and carries out her other domestic responsibilities. On the surface, it looks like a win-win situation. However, when 2,000 workers are forced into a rickety and badly constructed eight-storey building, then that is when the trouble really starts. My thought on that is that if Primark and many other clothing retailers fund these factories, they should make sure they're in good working order. But knowing that they have to rely on local builders and planners, they're probably just as ill-informed as the UK public on the true status of these buildings. I suppose in globalisation speak, if it ain't broke, don't mend it. There is of course a pro-sweatshop argument, and in 1997 Geoffrey Sachs, an economist, said, My concern is not that there are too many sweatshops, but there are too few. Sachs and other proponents of sweatshops cite the economic theory of comparative advantage, which states that international trade will, in the long run, make all parties better off. The theory holds that developing countries improve their condition by doing something that they do better than industrialised nations. In this case, they charge less but do the same work. Developed countries will also be better off because their workers can shift to jobs that they do better. These are jobs that some economists say usually entail a level of education and training that is exceptionally difficult to obtain in the developing world. Thus, economists like Sachs say, developing countries get factories and jobs that they would not otherwise get. Some would say a situation occurs when developing countries try to increase wages and the sweatshops tend to move on to a new state that is more welcoming. 
This leads to a situation where states often will not try to get increased wages for sweatshop workers for fear of losing investment and boosted GDP. However, this only means average wages around the world will increase at a steady rate. A nation only gets left behind if it demands wages higher than the current market price for that labour. When asked about the working condition in sweatshops, proponents say that although wages and working conditions may appear inferior by the standards of developed nations, they are actually improvements over what the people in developing countries have had before. It's said that if jobs in such factories did not improve their workers' standard of living, these workers would not have taken the jobs when they appeared. It's also often pointed out that, unlike in the industrialised world, the sweatshops are not replacing higher paying jobs. Rather, sweatshops offer an improvement over subsistence farming and other backbreaking tasks, or even prostitution, trash picking or starvation by unemployment. Now this sounds rather good, like communism on paper, very laudable. But of course, economists and most politicians miss the human factor out of these comments, as they are in fact talking about figures, not the human condition. It should be well known that if many, if not all of these poor people didn't work in sweatshops, they'd be begging and worse in their home countries, and indeed immigrating to the more industrialised countries of the West. By using sweatshops, at least further immigration from many of these countries involved is lessened, the tragedy is that for the most part these workers are not looked after and their working conditions to the Western eye look awful, but they are their working conditions and it's what they're used to. Also where Sachs is wrong is that the deindustrialized workers do not go on to attaining better education and fulfilling more professional jobs as a matter of course. He is also wrong in the assumption that it's a good thing for a country that subsidence farming is removed. That means fairly good farming land is being left idle in favour of manufacturing cheap clothing, which although pays local wages, doesn't significantly increase that country's economy or their farming industry. Now, although not an economist, and in fact someone who has even difficulty in reading figures, even I can see there's a circle of desperation, which has formed over the last 40-odd years with the growth of these sweatshops in India, China, Thailand, Philippines, Taiwan, South Korea and more. In the UK, we have de-industrialised our clothing manufacturing in this country to the extent that few, if any, clothing is still made in England. Thus, we have put our main reliance and money into other countries, and more importantly, into providing their populations with factories and work. Our population no longer has any home industries or clothing manufacturers left, but our workers didn't go off and get degrees in finance or IT, which is what Sachs intimated would happen. They simply stopped working, as their chosen professions dwindled. So our workers got poorer, which means the economy got poorer, and people were less able to spend money on expensive clothing, so had to fund indirectly the manufacturing systems abroad that had caused their hardships in the first place, forming an international circle of poverty and greed. We in the West may um and ah over the latest disaster to hit these poor workers, but it's easy to understand why sweatshops exist. When you can pop into any shop on the high street and buy a whole outfit for under £50, there must be a price to pay somewhere along the supply chain. Our desire for the latest must-haves has put increasing pressure on Western retailers to provide fashion which is fast, cheap and constantly changing. This desire was also the push that closed down the UK clothing factories and moved them abroad to developing countries where labour and overheads are cheaper. It was greed that closed down our UK-based factories and moved them lock, stock and barrel to countries in the east. Nothing more and nothing less. All the large supermarkets use sweatshops, all the large Costco's and even M&S have the majority of their stuff made in China. China has one of the largest manufacturing economies in the world. The workers are often afraid to stand up for their rights and in China unions are totally banned. Whilst those in the East will work to live, this doesn't apply to the sub-Saharan African. The percentage of the population living on less than $1 a day adjusted for inflation has fallen substantially in East Asia, while remaining relatively unchanged in sub-Saharan Africa. Data source? How have the world's poorest fared since the early 1980s? By Shosha Chen and Martin Revalion. 
which shows the ethnicity and religious leanings of most of the workers. The communist states rank high and the Muslim states rank very low on official sweatshops, although not in the slavery stats of importing poor workers to do menial work. Now, I'm not a socialist or a communist, but I do believe in fair conditions for all workers, even those abroad. In a fair world, I would bring back the clothing industry to this country, especially as we seem to accommodate so many so-called cheap workers from abroad anyway. Why not have them work in better conditions making clothes over here? But then that would unwittingly encourage the diversity freaks to bring in yet more foreigners to this country, wherein we are in fact full up and do away with the small incomes that these sweatshops abroad provide their indigenous peoples. These people would have to resort to past methods of obtaining a living, like begging or prostitution. There really is no solution for the greed and opportunists of both manufacturers and purchasers. All are guilty of the human state of believing what they hear or read. Child labour and sweatshop labour has been in the West culture for generations. From the mills to the grotty Jewish sweatshops in London at the turn of the century. From the child chimney sweep to the little kids selling matches. To underage child prostitutes. In China, girl babies were left out to die or sold. In India, babies had their legs broken so they could beg, which is worse. That in this day and age of enlightenment, there are still people who have to work in bad conditions. Or that there are still people who ignore it and profit from it which is worse. Also bear in mind we still have sweatshops in London and our major cities where we have heavily populated Asian immigrant communities, just as overworked and undercared for as in their homelands, which is worse. On the face of it, the West is shooting itself in the foot with one hand, yet perhaps preventing even worse abuse of humanity in the process. The truth is that we have beggared ourselves, both culturally and financially, to provide necessary work for other cultures, and as a nationalist, I personally feel this can't be a good thing for our future. The term boycotting should come into play here, of course, but who would suffer? Not the owners or the corporations, but the workers in the sweatshops. Their rates would plummet even lower and their safety would be even more compromised. Also, I would imagine that to get the average miss or missus in the UK, Europe or America to boycott Primark and other cheap outlets would be as much as an impossibility as to ban reality TV and cheap magazines which indirectly promote the sweatshops they might appear actively to oppose. Unlike anarchists, communists and atheists, I believe you can't have total destruction of government without replacing it with something else. You need order and you need state. Plants and animals don't do well alone or without structure. We need a nationalist structure in this country to make sure that we are the manufacturers of our own future and not rely totally on outside forces to exist. That is the point of being human. Adopt, adapt and improve. And finally, reported in the Telegraph, a sheep rescued after it was hit by a car and brought up with three puppies now believes it's a dog. 13-month-old Lamo is so sure he's a canine he fetches sticks and balls, wears a collar and a lead and jumps up on his hind legs and tries to bark. Lamo doesn't even recognise his own kind, preferring to chase rabbits instead. Owner Jennifer Jones, 45, who runs Rockfield Animal Rescue in Wentnor Shrops, took Lamo in when he was run over last February. She fed him milk and brought him up with her three dogs, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier called Wallace, a Jack Russell called Judy and a Labrador called Poppy. She said, Lamo was given to me as a terrified little lamb and we had no idea where he came from. There's a farm nearby but the farmer said it couldn't be his. I raised him with my three dogs, so now he thinks he's one of them. He really is wonderful. He follows us round everywhere and always under our feet. He doesn't care about the other sheep. He prefers humans. He's always trying to get our attention and is constantly getting up to mischief. Jennifer also takes Lamo round to her friends' houses to mow their lawn by chewing the grass and puts him on a lead to take him for walks at the weekend. Incredibly, the sheep also enjoys going for a quick doggy paddle in the local lake. She added, he gets really excited when we take him out in the van for a walk down the country lanes. He wriggles around and starts screwing his nose up. When we swing open the back doors, he's standing there panting and looking really pleased with himself. He loves a little swim now and again too. It's quite amazing to see him dive in for a quick dip. Oh dear. This presenter says this is a case of nature versus nurture, isn't it? What a lovely story to end the week on. There's hope for us all out there, isn't there? Remember, this is the last weekend before the elections. 
So if you're not standing, get ready to meet up and help leafleting or just get geared up to go and vote for the only party who loves Britain. Also beware nasty and untrue texts and communications getting through to your local organisers. Report them to your regional organiser. They're from an assortment of wannabes and has-beens. Don't give them a thought. We have better things to do. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and a very safe weekend. <laughs>